She's kin to Terry Gilkerson, isn't she? Oh, I I mean, wasn't he a well-known folk singer in the 60s? Oh. Yeah, asking, I, don't, I don't remember. Never mind, you I don't. I don't remember the 60s. Yeah. Um, anyway, she'll be here tomorrow night. Um, I don't have the ticket prizes for that, but doors open at 7, concert starts at 7.30. Um, Currently at the uh, at the uh, Winsboro Center for the Arts, there is a exhibit which will go on through the 22nd of this month by a um, fellow who grew up here at Winsboro, graduated from Winsboro High School about 30 years ago, named Scott Simons. And uh, the name of the exhibit is called Fields. He's an abstract artist. He's very well known in the Austin area. He's in several galleries down there. F F Y I, his mother was in my graduating class. Oh wow! I, I didn't know that either. Well, I'm learning a lot of stuff tonight. I'm excited. Uh, okay, the eighth um, of February. What is it? Anti up for poor well, when I, cause. P A W R S. When I'm up there. Annual fundraiser for the Winslow Animal Shelter will be at the Civic Center. If you're all by yourself, it's only $50 a ticket, and they give you a gazillion dollars worth of chips that you can gamble away off of the, uh, off of the support the animal children. For a couple, it's $90 for the ticket. You can buy additional chips if you run out of the chips that you need. All the money raised goes to support the animal children. On the 15th of February, at the Winslow Center for the Arts, a group Beyond the Pale, a Celtic group, they're excellent. I've seen them several times. They've been here many times over the years. I highly recommend them. The ticket prices for them are 18. The general mission 25 if you want a table up front. Um, then the annual fundraiser for the Fundler Center of the Arts. So it's called Starry Night this year. Not Starry, Starry Night. It's going to be a uh, kind of a Cirque du Soleil theme. Uh, the uh, tickets are $50 each. Uh, the auction and, uh, or, and the appetizers are at six, at seven, the dinner, and then they're having dancing afterwards this, this year. So you can stay there until your, you know, your, whatever your witching hour is. You, know. you turn into a pumpkin, just leave before you turn into a pumpkin. So you don't need any pumpkins this time of year. That's the uh, announcements I have. You'll hear more from Joe Dan when he gets up here. Uh, I do have, I, I, over there, just in the back of the top, there's a row of books facing the wrong way. <laughs> Those are all the poetry books that have come in in the last couple of months. And so you're welcome to go take a look through those. They're all priced. As usual, the price you pay is half the price that's marked on the book. 
One of the books that came in is a book by a gal named Lucille Sheed Germany. And we knew her as Lucy Germany. And this is called, it's a book of poetry uh, called Women and Other Living Things. And if any of you, any of you, if you still want to read from here, you're welcome to do it. This is to be read by women, and I'm not one of those. So. If you're interested, I'll leave it up here and you can read a poem or two from it. Most of them are very short poems. And this is personal, personal, this is a personal stuff. Let's see the cover of that. That's from our own Lucy German. That's right. Thank you. And I hope you'll take me up on that and come to read one or two of Lucy's poems. She's a wonderful poet. Um, she was a, a member, a founding member. She knew anything about any book you wanted. She worked in libraries all, all her life and knew books and never forgot anything. Is, is, guess, is her know. book going to be for sale too? Her book is for sale. Famous book. 
I won't tell you what it is, you probably know. <laughs> the name of this poem is The Mad Gardener's Song. He thought he saw an elephant that practiced on a fife. He looked again and found it was a letter from his wife. At length I realized, he said, the bitterness of life. He thought he saw a buffalo upon the chimney piece. He looked again and found it was his sister's husband's niece. Unless you leave this house, he said, I'll send for the police. He thought he saw a rattlesnake that questioned him in grief. He looked again and found it was the middle of next week. The one thing I regret, he said, is that it cannot speak. He thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from the bus. He looked again and found it was a hippopotamus. If this should stay to dine, he said, there won't be much for us. He thought he saw a kangaroo that worked a coffee mill. He looked again and found it was a vegetable pill. Where were I to swallow this, he said, I should be very ill. He thought he saw a coach and four that stood beside his bed. He looked again and found it was a bear without a head. Poor thing, he said, poor silly thing. It's waiting to be fed. He thought he saw an albatross that fluttered round the lamp. He looked again and found it was a penny postage stamp. You'd best be getting home, he said. The nights are very damp. He thought he saw a garden door that opened with a key. He looked again and found it was a double rule of three. And all its mystery, he said, is clear as day to me. He thought he saw an argument that proved he was the Pope. He looked again and found it was a bar of muddled soap. A fact so dread, he faintly said, extinguishes all hope. Lewis Cowan. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, I'll read a couple more. This is called The Preacher's Vacation. The old man went to meeting, for the day was bright and fair. Though his limbs were very tottering, and t'was hard to travel there. But he hungered for the gospel. So he trudged the weary way on the road so rust, rough and dusty neath the summer's burning day. By and by he reached the building to his soul a holy place. Then he paused and wiped the sweat drops off his thin and wrinkled face. But he looked around bewildered for the old bell did not toll and the doors were shut and bolted and he did not see a soul. So he leaned upon his crutches, and he said, what does it mean? And he looked this way and that, till it seemed almost a dream. He had walked the dusty highway, and he breathed a heavy sigh, just to go once more to meet him, ere the summons came to die. But he saw a little notice tacked upon the meeting door, so he limped along to read it, and he read it o'er and o'er. Then he wiped his dusty glasses, and he read it o'er again, till his limbs began to tremble, and his eyes began to pain. As the old man read the notice, how it made his spirit burn, pastor absent on vacation, churches closed till his return. Then he staggered slowly backward, and he sat down, him down to think, for his soul was stirred within him, till he thought his heart would sink. So he mused along and wondered, 
to himself soliloquized, I have lived to almost 80 and was never so surprised. As I read that oddest notice sticking on the meeting door, passed her on vacation, never heard the like before. Why, when I first adjourned the meeting, very many years ago, preachers traveled on the circuit in the heat and through the snow. If they got their clothes and bills, twas but little cash they got. They said nothing about vacation, but were happy in their lot. Would the farmer leave his cattle or the shepherd leave his sheep? Who would give them care and shelter or provide them food to eat? So it strikes me very singular that a man of holy hands thinks he needs to have vacation and forsakes his tender lands. Did St. Paul get such a no notion? Did a, did a Wesley or a Knox? Did they in the heat of summer turn away from needy flocks? Did they shut their meeting house? Just go and lounge about? Why, they knew that if they did, Satan certainly would shout. Do the taverns close their doors just to take a little rest? Why, twould be the height of nonsense, or their trade would be distressed. Did you ever know it happen or hear anybody tell Satan taking a vacation, shutting up the doors of hell? <laughs> and shall preachers of the gospel pack their trunks and go away, leaving saints and dying sinners get along as best they may? Are the souls of saints and sinners valued less than settling beer? Or do preachers tire quicker than the rest of mortals here? Why it is, I cannot answer, but my feelings, they are stirred. Have I dragged my tottering footsteps uh, for to hear the gospel word? But the preacher is a traveler, and the meeting house is closed. I confess it's very trying, hard indeed, to keep composed. Tell me, when I tread the valley and go up the shining height. Will I hear no angels singing? Will I see no gleaming light? Will the golden harps be silent? Will I meet no welcome there? Why, the thought is most distressing would be more than I could bear. Tell me, when I reach the city over on the other shore, will I find a little notice tacked upon the golden door telling me mid dreadful silence writ in words that cut and burn Jesus, absent on vacation, heaven closed till his return. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still anonymous. Uh, nobody knows you. Okay. I'm going to read one more and then uh, um, hand it over to somebody else. This is, this is called To a Thesaurus. Now, anybody knows what a thesaurus is? Uh, it's a book you have on, if you're a writer, you have a thesaurus on your deck next to your dictionary. It gives, you, it gives you similar words for the same word that you were thinking of. And you get tired of using that word over and over again, so you pick another one. Okay, that's what you use a thesaurus for. This was written by a man named Franklin P. Adams. Two at thesaurus. Oh, precious codex, volume, tome, book, writing, compilation, work. Attend the while I pen a poem, a jest, a jape, a quip, a quirk. For I would pen, engross, indict, transcribe, set forth, compose, address, record, submit, yea, even write an ode, an elegy to bless. To bless, set store by, celebrate, approve, esteem, endow with soul, commend, acclaim, appreciate, immortalize, laud, praise, extol. Thy merit, goodness, value, worth, expedience, utility, O oh, manna, honey, salt of earth, I sing, I chant, I worship thee. How could I manage, live, exist, obtain, produce, be real, prevail, be present in the flesh, subsist, have place, become, breathe, or inhale? Without thy help, recruit, support, Capitulation, furtherance, assistance, rescue, aid, resort, favor, sustention, and advance. 
Alas, alack, and well a day. My case would be, would, would then be dour and sad. Likewise distressing, dismal, gray, pathetic, mournful, dreary, bad. Though I could keep us up all day, this lyric, elegiac song, me seems, hath come the time to say farewell, adieu, goodbye, so long. And with that, I will say so long. Everybody have a great day, and we'll see who's next. Can you hear me?
compressed into the creaking ties and soft, dusty bed. Percussion played at sunset, and the cooling shiver, the echo of the old rails. Final contractions, I see them through the mist of distance, hear the muscled sound of purpose as the wheels slowly, slowly roll to that spot where the railroad track meets. And this story is by Railway Journeys Poetry. They had some hard work in there. <laughs> I worked it twice. <laughs> then I seen, a, let's see, there's one more, about friends. And it has an author of H-A-U-N-T-I-E. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> uh, it's about friends. Let's see. That I could be this human at this time, breathing, looking, seeing, smelling. That I also could be this at this moment, at this time, resting calmly, moving freely. That I could be this excellence at this time, sudden change, peaceful and woke. To all my friends who have been with me in weakness, when waterfalls rush down my sides. To all my friends who have felt me in anguish. And where did you go? I just lost it. Don't you like the phones, how they just disappear? <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it here. Let's see. Let's see. That I could be this excellent at this time, sudden, Change peaceful and woke. To all my friends who have been with me in weakness when waterfalls rush down my sides. To all my friends who have felt me in anguish when this earth back breaks beneath, between the crack of two blades. To all my friends who have held me in rage when fire tears through, swallows behind tight grins. I know you and I see you and I hear you. And one more for the road. This one I have on paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Hobo's Life Story. And I forgot to put the author on there. <laughs> so I say it's by me. <laughs> Hobo's Life Story. I took a job on an extra, extra gang way up in the mountain. I paid my fee and the shack shipped me. And the ties I soon was counting. Well, the boss, he put me driving spikes, and the sweat was enough to blind me. He didn't seem to like my pace, so I left the job behind me. I grabbed a hold of an old freight train, and around the country traveled. The mysteries of a hobo's life, to me, were so unraveled. I traveled east, and I traveled west, and the shacks could never find me. Next morning, I was miles away from the job I left behind. I ran across a bunch of stiffs who were known as industrial workers. They taught me how to be a man and how to fight the shriekers. I kicked right in and joined the bunch, and now in the ranks you'll find me. Hooray for the cause to hell with the bosses and the job I left behind me. <laughs> Next. He, he was here, wasn't he? Move, move a couple of inches closer to your left, so you're closer to the mic. Now I can't see the blue. <laughs> Summer and those freezing winter days. 
Who wouldn't trade their worn out cat for trappings of a king? We still believe in God and country and the joy that family brings. Men who still believe that freedom is the most important thing in life, that treat a lady with respect, be she a stranger or your wife. Use a different way to score the tally book of success, who keep the company of horse and cow and avoid cities urban mess. Success they major by their ruler of honesty and truth. Though manner may be harshful and their style a bit uncouth. The ways have stood the test of time, the wear well have more pedigree, and those revelant heroes of the West have created 10 million wannabes. <laughs> All right. I like this one. This is called What a Nickel's Worth. Now, we all know men who are close with the buck, what some folks might refer to as fruit. But the tightest man I ever knew was a cowboy named Scotty McDo. We both worked a while on a rafter team for old man Edmonds and son. And Scotty was pleasant and sure enough hand, but he was a tight fist in the son of a gun. I remember once in the bunkhouse poker game, he was holding harps, jack to ace. When the dealer said cards, Shorty said, I'll take one, and that 10 fell to the place. An unbeatable hand was what Scott's from hell, but he couldn't give up, give up his old ways. All he could do was just call the bets. He could not make him say all raise. Well, one day, one payday, I made a trip to the outhouse. It was an old two holder out back. And when I opened the door, there sat Scotty, just taking a cob from the shack, sack, I'm sorry. As he pulled up his bridges, it happened a nickel rolled out of his pocket and fell down that hole just ahead of his hand, though he grabbed with the speed of a rocket. His old bottom lip started to tremble, and his face got red as a beat. He cursed and he swore, and his eyes filled with tears as he kicked at the door with his feet. Then what he did next was unnerving. I figured he lost all control because he reached in his pocket and took out of all his money and threw it right down in the hole. I said, Shorty, what in the world are you doing? You just throw away all your pain. Swallowing hard to gain control of his voice, these words old Scotty said, I laddie, tis a black day. Dang fate is mean and she's fickle. You know, I'll climb down in that neck and I'll beat her again, but it's got to be worth more than a nickel. <laughs> Okay, this is Red Stigall. The Bell on Old Blue. Let me tell you a story about a tarnished old bell. It's in the hands of Grant Speed, my good friend. A graphic reminder of the glorious West and of horses and cattle and men. It hung around the neck of an old good night steer, the big one the cowboys called Blue. The colonel had got him on the bosky from Chisholm in the winter of 72. The colonel sent thousands of steers at the trail. They learned to follow that bell day and night. At Sundance, at sundown, the boss would strap on the clapper so the steers would stay bedded and quiet. If old Blue got restless and started to roam, there'd be a stampede sure as hell. The cattle would immediately be on their feet and move toward the sound of the bell. I remember a camp out on Seven Mile Hill in the distance where the Dodge City lights. About morning, it started storming like hell. Lightning balls danced in the night. The boss yelled, find old Blue and undo the clapper. Get him up, string him out on the trail. Blue swam the river, ran straight for the yards with 2,000 steers on his tail. Well, the rail cars were loaded and we headed ourselves. The boys stayed in Dodge, except a few like me, Frank Mitchell, and Clubfooted Jack. We took the wagon, the Bermuda, and Blue. The sky seemed a lot bluer out on the trail, though the range where the buffalo roam, where the de dust devils danced their walls in the wind. Old Blue was leading us home. Blue was 
turned out at the Kitty Key Ranch like a gentleman pampered in style, but with a plate occasionally necking to an old outlaw steer. Blue loved that head dragon for mile. When the Lord called old Blue up to the trail in the sky, the colonel had, had us cut off his homes. He said, Blue don't need them. They'll remind us of him and the trail drives and stampedes and storms. Well, we still work cattle. We don't trail them to dodge, because fences now stand in the way. And the colonel, colonel, he's riding that trail in the sky, but the cowboys still brand the J.A. As I reminisce, I'm reminded that I'm one of the fortunate few who's had the privilege of hearing and I heard her song and the sound of that bell on Old Blue. I got one little short one here somewhere I found. Okay. Hats off to the cowboy. The city folks think that it's over. The cowboy has outlived his time. An old worn out relic, a thing of the past. But the truth is, he's still in his prime. The cowboy is the image of freedom, the hard ride and the boss of the range. His trade is a fair one. He fights for what's right, and his eth ethics aren't subject to change. He still tips his hat to the ladies that you water first at the pump. He believes a day's pay is worth a day's work, and his handshake and word are his bond. I'll have something for next time. All right, I did make it. I'm up here. I was over in Tyler today visiting my doctor, and while I was there, I happened to go in and visit Jeff Hightower. Y'all knew about Jeff, I guess. And thought he had a heart attack. Turned out to be that he had blood clots in his lungs, so he's doing real good. He looked pretty good, so I think he's going to get out of there alive. At least he's hoping to. Which hospital is he in? Uh, mother. Francis, Francis yeah. uh, 4429, one of those towers. I forget which tower. Yeah. She gets there, he didn't see him. He don't want to be there anymore. He has to be, and I know about that. I've been there too. Uh, I was listening to Jim's story. It reminded me something happened to me when I was in the military down in Roosevelt Road, Puerto Rico, into the bathroom. One of the locals there said, Look, quarters in the urinals. He said, I wouldn't stick my hand in there for a quarter, so he pulled out another quarter. So he said, I went for 50 cents. <laughs> uh, and Conrad. Everybody has it for us. Badgers not drinking, you know. I found out a long time ago how you could tell who was a Badgers and who was a Lutheran. If you happen to meet a Lutheran at the beer joint, he'll speak to you. You meet a Badgers, you act like he didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite funny. You know, I'm. Moved here from down in the Corpus area in 2003, December 2003. And we had some people come in and box up a lot of stuff and they sent it into storage over there. And sat there from 2003 to about 2014. And my kids decided to see what was in those boxes. You know, if we didn't, hadn't used them in 10 years, we ought to throw them away. They found some pictures in there and they said, We don't know these people, now. who are these strangers? You know? So I was reading through it. A book, and I ran across this thing called Strangers in the Box. And I might have used this before, I don't know, but it says, Come look with me inside the drawer in this box. I've often seen all the pictures, black and white, faces proud and still serene. I wish I knew the people, these strangers in the box. Their names and all their memories are lost among the socks. I wonder what their lives would be like, how they, how did they spend their days, what about their special time? I'll never know their ways. If only someone would have taken time to tell me what and when and who, who, what and when, those faces of my heritage would come to life again. Could this become the fate of the pictures we take today? The faces and the memories someday would be tossed away. Make time to save your pictures. Seize the opportunity when it knocks or someday you and yours could be the strangers in the box. <laughs> that was written by, and all it had one name, K-A-H-T-I-N, Catan. You know the name familiar to anybody? That's what it says on, on the page. 
And as I was looking through some stuff the other day, I got up to 26 degrees and I left one of my vehicles sitting outside and it had a tremendous amount of ice on it. So I knew it was, had been a wintry night. And a guy named Lindsey Cooster wrote a poem about a wintry night. It said, the sky is dark and the ground is white. The world is peaceful on this wintry night. No one around, not a sound to be heard, not a laugh, not a car, not even a bird. For a moment, it's just the snow and me. I smile inside, and I feel so free. I don't know that guy either. I thought that was pretty neat. But the day I went out, there was less than 20, 20, about 26 degrees, plenty, plenty of ice around. One of the first times this year that I saw ice in my dog and water bowl. <laughs> One of my favorite guys, and I know I've used this before, but Robert Frost. It's called Stopping by the Woods on the Snowy Evening. I like that, you know. It, it take a minute to think about it. He was on horseback back in the 1800s, and he had a, a real important mission, but he came upon these woods, and the snow began to fall, you know, and he couldn't resist. He was a nature bug. He couldn't resist this stopping look. He starts out with saying, whose woods these are? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with the snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and the frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harmless bells a shake, his harness bells a shake, to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and snowy flakes. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. So I'm going to end right there. But uh, tonight when I leave here, I'm going to the lock, stock, and barrel. Ron Lawson and the Smoky Kingdom Man going to be making some music there. So if anybody wants to go, I want to ride in the back of my truck. You're welcome. Thank you. Where is this? And it's in uh, Mount Vernon. It's got right an intersection of 21 and 37, a little restaurant there called Lock, Stock, and Barrel. He played there several. We were there on New Year's Eve, as a matter of fact. It's a pretty good place. That's yeah, some good food. feelings of delight, thoughts of pleasure that you give me every day and every night. I'm grateful for each day and hour. I thank the Lord above for giving me the precious gift of your deep and enduring love. As our lives go on and on, only one thing is true. To the very end, I'll always wish to have more time with you and more love with you. Who, who wrote that? Joanna Fox. Fox. <laughs> if you see them just... Let me find my other one. And Doc's forcing me to be up here. <laughs> Every year, by Joanna Fox. Every year that I'm with you has been better and better than before. It's hard for me to even think how I could love you more. Every year you grace my life has been full of happiness. I love your caring face, your voice, your tender, sweet care. Every year when this day comes, I'm filled with love and pleasure. Happy anniversary, love, my joy, my delight, my treasure. One more. Because of you, I was self-sufficient, gratified by my independence. Alone but not lonely, I thought, but I was restless, searching blindly for something to fill an empty place. I didn't even know I had 
dimly aware that I was somehow unfinished, then you came and filled everything, every space, every need. Even the sweet dreams, the secrets I had concealed for myself, I was self-sufficient. And that's from Joanne Paul. Thank you. Well, as most of y'all know, I do nursing home ministry and all that. But recently, the last few weeks and months, my attention pretty much needs to be focused on the youth. There's a, been two uh, successful, if you want to say so, suicides in the Winsboro area the last couple of weeks. And, of course, uh, some attempted suicides, which is affecting our family. But I come across this one poem. I want to read that before I read my positive one. But it's called Restless Nights. It's by Pete Sonero. I'm breaking. I can't be fixed. I'm missing. But I won't be missed. Still shaking from what I fear. I can't let you in. So don't come near. I guess you're right. I'm way too thin. And I'm fighting a battle that I'll never win. I have so many flaws. I don't know where to start. From my messed up hair to my messed up heart. So what's the point to continue to fight when my restless days turn into restless nights? This life hasn't been fair. I can finally tell that few cares. And it hurts like hell. I still don't understand what was God's cause. Why did he put me on earth with all my flaws? Was I born just to die? Am I part of a plan made to finally see that I won't die an old man? I don't know how to live. I have nothing to gain. And all I want from you is to end all my pain. I'm losing sight of what I've already seen. I'm losing my grip and I'm barely 17. That's all that one. One close not only has Situations like that going on, it's all over the country. This one here, since uh, Joe Dan's going to be talking about uh, what we're going to be doing tomorrow night. This is where words fail, music speaks. And I found that to be true at the nursing homes. Is this your poem? Uh, no, this is by Lucy Rutland. She wrote it in, in March of 2011. Where words fail, music speaks. It speaks of pain, of the sorrow, of the lost, of life we live. It shares emotions. It's a way to connect, to understand what others feel. Where words fail, music speaks. It tells the truth whenever you want to or not. Music shares the souls of those we're around, of those in the world that we're living. I wish to share my music with you so you can understand the pain I feel, so I can share my soul with you so you can understand what I'm going through. Thank you.
happen to have been lucky enough to have been one of the founding members of this organization, which was really founded by Bonnie Sirkeechan White, but she picked uh, four or five of us to join her on that first meeting. And I have a newspaper clipping here for a picture of the members of the founding group of the Latin Poets Society. And this Winsburg News article and photo is dated April the 8th, 2010. And it says, First Poets Society Meeting. First meeting of the newly formed Live Poets Society was held recently at the Winsboro Center for the Arts, 200 Market Street. Next meeting is set for Friday, April 16th. Attending the meeting were Bonnie Sarkeesian White, Liz Sattendick, Joanne Boyd, Karen Jerome, Johnny Jerome, Angela Wiley, and Lucy Germany. The one that uh, Conrad mentioned a while ago and has passed the book around. Is that it, Jill, of uh, Doc's spot there? Yes. Is that the Lucy Germany book? Uh, Lucy had uh, maybe, uh, I think she had more than one book of poems published. Uh, I, I'll just say, this date should remind us all um, that we are approaching our 10 year anniversary. So that will be um, next, next meeting, the second meeting was scheduled for Friday, April 16, and so that means our first meeting was in March. Uh, so in March, we need to start thinking right now what we're going to do to celebrate <laughs> that 10th anniversary meeting. So that's one more in between February meeting coming up. That'll be the only one before our 10th anniversary meeting. So be thinking about that. You'll be taking ice cream furnished by Doc. What? Cake and ice cream lettered and furnished by Doc and Jill. Okay. And the uh, by the same. <laughs> in the way of announcements, uh, I'll just mention that Ken read uh, a poem by Robert Frost, Miles to Go Before I Keep. I don't know, was, was that the title? Or? No, it was called Stopping by Woods of the Snowy Eve. Okay. Uh, the, you know, Robert Frost was even more famous when I was in school than he is now. In fact, that particular poem was required memory work in one of my English classes in WHS, Winsboro High School. <laughs> so I was quite familiar with that and glad to hear it read aloud tonight. Uh, I, last, last month when we met here, I went through some of Conrad's books that he had for sale and bought a Robert Frost poems book from him, and I've, I've been reading, uh, and there's some really, uh, you know, one that I was tempted to read tonight is called, which I'd never heard or read before, called The Witch of Coos, <laughs> C-O-O-S, uh, and uh, it, it, that is a extremely strange poem for Robert Frost's family, you know, it's not, it doesn't fit into any of the categories that we normally associate with him. And there was another one in here that caught my attention called Home Burial. Now, you know, home burials used to be very common. Uh, you know, people had uh, private cemeteries at home. Uh, that sort of thing was, and so in fact, Lee Cemetery, you know, the primary cemetery in the, for this area. You know, the city, Winsworth City Cemetery has been full for a long time. There's a sign, there's a, <laughs> like that uh, sign that uh, Ken was talking about on you know, the church, you know, about pastor on vacation, church closed. <laughs> uh, there's some kind of sign, I think, on the city cemetery. I don't know what it says. I'm not even sure there's a sign, but I'm sure since it's a closed cemetery, there's probably some 
reference to that. Uh, in, in the, if not in the, on the gate to the cemetery, at least in the Bill Jones history of the cemetery. But the point I'm getting at is, you know, that there's no room for more, more burials there. And Lee Cemetery uh, started in 1856. And uh, that was during, in fact, it was a family cemetery when it started. It was the Lee family cemetery. And that little plot that contained the, the uh, descendants of Benjamin Lee and uh, is still cordoned off by a wrought iron fence there in the big Lee Cemetery, which is now a little over 10 acres. You know, uh, this was a family cemetery that caught on early on in the history of this area. And people started asking the Lee family, could, could we bury our kin, our family, in your cemetery? And, you know, he would agree to that, I'm sure, uh, at times, maybe sometimes he didn't. But over time, it became a public cemetery. It's a non-profit cemetery. Um, and believe me, that makes a difference. You know, I've, I've been to, uh, I, I happen to be chairman of the board of the Lee Cemetery, and when we, when we put in the uh, lawn crib system in 2001, you know, we, uh, we asked to visit the nearest one of those uh, private cemeteries, which happened to be in, uh, uh, Hot Springs, Hot Springs, Arkansas. I went up there and spent a day, and I found everything that was priced in this for-profit cemetery was several times higher than everything at Lee Cemetery. So that's the difference between a, a non-profit and a, and a for-profit cemetery. Um, now I'm going to just mention a current event tomorrow night at Tenney Chapel the uh, monthly, the third Saturday night music night will take place. And it starts at 6.30, ends at 8. It's free, open to the public, um, and you're, everyone's welcome to be there. Some of you are regulars there, others not so much, but it's open to anybody who wants to come. Some of you will remember that I have been um, reading poetry from my best friend in high school, Bartow Fanning, and this is the title page that he put on a collection of some of his, what he thought was his better poems. It's called Bartow's Verse, and I've read a few of those in the past few months. I'm going to read a couple of short ones tonight in his honor. Bartow Fanning, again, is the name. His actual name is Norris Lynn Fanning, but his dad was named Bart Fanning, and when he was in high school, everybody called him Barto. <laughs> Not sure why, but they did, and he answered to it, still does. So, you know, some of you, like me, have probably had occasion to have a neighbor who was not the most friendly, and maybe not your most favorite person. I mean, I don't know, probably, it's hard for me to see how anybody could live even a few years and not have that happen to them at least once in their life. And so Bartow was so inspired when that trial of his life ended, when one of his neighbors was moving, that he sat down and wrote this poem and the title of it is, my, my Neighbor is Moving. So I'm going to read that and then I'm going to conclude with another one. Um, this kind of, this is a realism point. You know, that he tells it like it was for his experience with that neighbor. Some of it's humorous and some of it is tragic. My neighbor is moving. Hooray, hooray. Bon voyage and Godspeed on his way. I've tried to be neighborly, friendly, polite, always figured, takes two to fight. 
I told him my name. He just looked at me blank. He said, I prefer to be addressed by my rank. Yes, sir, Major, I said, whatever you say, my snappy salute, he took the wrong way. He may not be a real jackass, per se, but he surely did rub me the wrong way. And I'm South and I'm Texas and I'm proud of it. He's a damn Yankee and he's not ashamed of it. On election day, he goes to the wrong primary. His politics make me look plum reactionary. His kids show no respect and they dress a disgrace. They trash talk their elders right to their face. His kids are just rotten all down the line, but he freely advises me how to raise mine. They just play loud music all day, all day. I swear you could hear it two miles away. They never heard of Hank or Dylan, Beethoven or Bach. Their 15-inch woofers play screaming punk rock. He cheers for the visitors at every home game, and he takes the good Lord's name in vain. The trip to Las Vegas is his idea of fun. He never goes fishing, and he don't own a gun. His cat is a hideous lard and furball. Pampered and powdered, fixed and declawed. His dog barks at nothing from dusk to dawn, and then he comes over and poops on my lawn. My neighbor is booing. Hooray, hooray, bon voyage, and Godspeed on his way. Barto fan. <laughs> I think I know it. <laughs> Now, all of us have known that fellow, I think, at you know, one time or another. Uh, this final one is a more serious form uh, in my mind, and I think one of his really better efforts. It's called Bartow on Time. Yesterday it was a week ago tomorrow, and too soon tomorrow is history. Where has all of this year gone? Now whole seasons get away from me, but to a child who is impatient for promises you have not met, directly seems to take forever. By and by, you might as well forget. Time, they say, is a curious thing, a corner of forever folded up and torn. On it, they say, our fate is written from the moment we're born. But time's not sand in an hourglass, not the pages in a book. All those days behind us were marked by the toll they took. But the future has not happened yet, and it very well may not, at least not the way we think it will. From the projections that we've got, not knowing time, we grossly err. Perceptions flawed fatally somehow, while we hurtle through eternity on a wave I call the plane of now. You never have enough time, so what you do, you best do quick, because time is thin on the plane of now, not a nanosecond thick. Circumstances be in the way things are. In collision, events make. Events change the way we are and the history in their wake. Magnitude and proximity are the only tools you own. The shadows that you cast today are not persistent when you're gone. So you be sure to leave some mark to show you have been here, or your life will count for nothing, with no weeping over your beer. Beer is spelled B-I-E-R, by the way. Uh, Barto Fanning, my best friend and one of my favorite poets. We always try.
tradition, I close with a paragraph from How to Read a Poem, subtitled And Fall in Love with Poetry by Edward Hirsch. Uh, we're on uh, page, or chapter 3 now, page 47. We'll probably, when this organization is century old, we'll, we'll be finished with another 90 years. Uh, another nine more decades. I want to look closely at three poems, one by John Keats that gestures toward and seeks connection, one by James Wright that finds a momentary human contact and communion, and one by Charles Bowley that shuns any such contact or affinity. I want to see what is being offered us and what is being withheld. Each of these poems seeks to go beyond the ambiguity of words to the certainty of touch. And uh, unfortunately, that paragraph ends here. And we will pick that up next month and continue the search. Uh, Trevor, is that the way you pronounce your name? Trevor. Trevor. Yes, sir. Uh, would you like to say anything to the group? about your interest in love of poetry and friendship with Conrad or anything? Yeah, uh, come on up. Everybody, uh, come up to the microphone and we'll get you on tape. <laughs> I, just, I just appreciate everybody here in Winsboro. I say all y'all in the store all the time. Uh, that helps, helps support me and our company, you know. Without y'all, I wouldn't be here, so appreciate everybody. And uh, next time, I want to go try and one read, so. Great job in the public side. Thank you. I appreciate everybody coming in and everything. I appreciate y'all very much. You blow up all the blows from the birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> Had a good time. I'll be, I'll be back every month. Conrad's going to come in there and remind me. That's right. Yep. He always tells me, you keep on thinking, I'll keep on grinning. That's right. I'm a grinner. I'm not much of a bigger, but I'm a grinner. <laughs> all right. Well, I conclude. Are we still... Recording, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, go ahead.